sort of, um, if you've got the app, checked in this morning. And it's one of those things, is with, through this whole COVID situation that we've sort of been going through, uh, when, the, the, when the first people come up that have got the virus and start spreading or whatever, your contact traces are going through, and then they start sharing about, oh, this person went here, 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 here. And you sort of think to yourself, man, there's people get around a bit. <laughs> they went for a shopping center in Knox and then they were seen in Seymour and then they went over here and you think, oh, I don't know if I, I know exactly where I've been in this last little while, but I don't know if you feel the same, but the amount that we have to check in these days, every single store that you go to, you're opening up your thing. And then I started thinking, just over the last week, how much I've actually and we as a family have filled in. So last Friday, so Friday, not last Friday, but Friday before, we had our first um, club K4K, which is our kids' uh, primary youth. Uh, so grades one to grade six. We had it here, we had a movie night, um, or movie afternoon, and we had about, I think we had about nine, 10 kids uh, here. We set up a little movie theater here. Um, that, so it was really good, it was really well attended. Uh, and, and I think the kids had some fun, and that was the first one. So we'll do that each month when we have youth. Uh, and then after that, we had youth, which, uh, which was well attended as well. We had another movie uh, evening. Um, they weren't quite as attentive to the movie as, uh, as, as the younger kids were, so I sort of learned that. Um, they're more attentive to their phones these days. So I did have to go around and say, give me half an hour, half an hour without your phone. Um, but that's a, that's a learning, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later on as well. Um, so we fit that into the evening, so that was nice. That was a learning to go, okay, well, we can do two in one day, that's, that's fine. Um, and then we sort of have the weekend and we cram in a bit of footy on, on Sunday and, and all that sort of thing that goes with it. That's a long day, it starts off about 6.30, uh, finished up at about, well, I think it was about 8.30, 9 o'clock sort of thing that evening after, after family meals and things uh, like that in the evening. Then on Monday, we sort out and bought my daughter a bed where a new bed, she's waiting for her double bed. Her, she's got the, the, uh, the throne ready to go. She's, uh, she's going to be nice and set up in her princess environment there. Uh, Tuesday, I can't even remember what we did Tuesday, so that's, that's a bit of a blur. I think we did some uh, housework and stayed at home. And Wednesday, we went off to Bendigo, so we did that. We traveled through up to Bendigo, bought ourselves a table as we sought after the quest to finally after, what are we now? 17, 18 years, going to 19 years of marriage to finally get furniture that matches in our house. <laughs> so we started to do that. And that was Wednesday. It was not really a, a, a set out purchase, but it happened. Uh, as we used to enter Bendigo, we spent some time in Bendigo. We drove through, we went to a Chinese museum, we went to lunch, we, uh, we had dinner at the hotel, we went swimming until all hours at night because it's an indoor pool. And I found that reclining chair that I was looking for last time I spoke. I had a reclining chair by a pool and I found it again. That was really good. Uh, and then Friday, we just ventured home, just uh, just me um, mosey home for it with my cousin who lives up in Bendigo, we did that. And then yesterday, I don't even know, what did we do yesterday? Oh yeah, it was my birthday yesterday. So we went to Ballarat and had lunch. So all these things, you start to go, man, do cram in a fair bit during the week. This is crazy. So if I had COVID and I don't, but if I came up and had and the contact tracers had to do a thing on me, man, you're going to do some research. There's a lot going on. So then I start to sort of think, well, we're talking about leadership and all of the things that leaders do. And there are some of us that sort of naturally go into leadership, but there's some that go, I don't want to do that leadership thing because it looks like they cram a lot in and it looks like they've got lots of responsibility and it looks like they do a lot but really we all do a lot and maybe it's not quite as much as you think that, that leaders are doing because we've had to rethink and reshape the way that we think about leadership because of the changing nature of the world, changing nature of our community. We have to uh, be a lot more adaptable in leadership. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk today uh, about the small things that can grow into larger things. 
And I think when we talk about sort of leadership and all those sort of things, we, 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 we hear people talk big picture and, and, and people go, well, let's look at the broad nature of things and, and, and go to something huge. But in actual fact, the Bible sort of points us to those little things, the, the small things that can grow into the biggest of things. Uh, and in particular, um, looking at the passages of Scripture around the mustard seed plant and the description that Jesus gives of the kingdom, kingdom of God being like a mustard seed that grows into a big, ginormous tree. So before we begin, let's pray. Father God, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Open our hearts, open our minds to your presence here this morning and allow us to hear from you as we go through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So, one of the passages that we focused quite uh, closely on in the last little while is, um, is that of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. That, for us, gives us the authority from Christ that we are all leaders. We have been commanded, commissioned to go and make disciples. And therefore, as we've been praying this morning, shine a light into the community. Shine a light into the people's lives that we come across each and every day. So we are leaders because we've been given that responsibility. As soon as we accept Lord Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, we have that responsibility. We're now all leaders. Hopefully that doesn't scare everyone, but that's, that's the reality of what it is. We've been given this responsibility. When... Um, my daughter turned three, she's just over there. They love it when I speak about them. They just they go, oh, can you speak about me next time? <laughs> no, they don't. Actually, they, they hate it. <laughs> but anyway, she's over there. Say hello later. But when she was, when she was, uh, she just turned three, going on like 18, as she's going, it's like she's still going into her teenage years now, but uh, she's eight. Um, she was in the back of the car and, and Susan, my wife, told me a, a bit of a story about how she was eating a sandwich and she sort of goes to mum, to, to her mum, where did this come from? Now, that was a question about a sandwich. It could have been much worse. It could have been a question of where did I come from? And that's the whole conversation for another day. But she said, where does this sandwich come from? And I'm like, oh, well, I made it. It came from home. Yeah, but where did, where did it come from? Oh, well, I've got the supplies from the shots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did that come from? And so that sort of came up and went, went along and, um, and, and that bit. Maybe. Do we ever sort of sit there and eat a sandwich and... <laughs> I saw some pictures yesterday of the bread making. And I had to zoom in at one point uh, for one of the pictures because out of the bowl was like this blob just like growing. Out of the out of the thing, I'm thinking, what the heck is that? And I found out it was the it was the dough, it was the, the yeast that was sort of growing out of the bowl. And it's amazing to think that your, your yeast is just this little powder, but before that, it's just sort of this little plant that sort of grows, and away you go. But that then goes from a small beginning to bread, and then we eat it and we grow. So that's what I wanted to focus on, is growing great things from small beginnings. We, on our holidays, we, uh, we went to uh, the, the lights, light show, I the light show that Bendigo puts on uh, in a, the park or in sort of the botanic garden type situation. And you're walking through all of, all of the gardens that along the paths and they're shining lights up into the trees and across the grass and it's really, really beautiful setting. But at one point we sort of looked up and a couple of these trees, and they were huge. Like they were, they were sort of probably 20, 30, maybe 40 meters above the ground. And you sort of think, wow, those things have been there for so long. 
And we only have to look down the Avenue of Honour and see the same sort of thing. Trees that have been there for 10, 20, 50, 100 years, 100 years these huge structures, what did they start out like? Really small. And so from these great things, they come from small beginnings. So I want to have a look at, um, at, at four different, different aspects of these small beginnings and how, as leaders, we, we can use these things to, to keep going. And maybe there's just that small aspect of leadership within you that says, okay, I can do these things. So we're going to look at expectation and the surprise when things start going well, that little dip that happens and a determination determination that happens. So we're going to turn to Mark 4, uh, Mark 4 verses 30 to 32 this morning. <coughs> you have your Bibles. Turn to Mark 4 verses 30 to 32. The parable of the mustard seed. And again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. With such big branches, that all the birds of the air can perch in its shade. So, I wish I had a slide to show you, but you can Google it. All the bones and bits and pieces. But the mustard seed plant, if you have a look at it, the mustard seed is this little tiny grain that can grow into this huge, like the different sizes over time, that grows into this huge structural plant that, that just expands out many many meters across and just has uh, can have huge leaves and be a, a place which houses many many animals just such, such as these trees so for us we, we saw this structure that was there but we when we went to, we went back to this park in bendigo the next day in the trees as we saw a little bit clearer were hanging these bats i love bats i don't i don't want them because they're probably really like weird and disgusting. But they're hanging from the, the branches in the trees. Now, we didn't see this at night time, but seeing it from a different perspective, a different angle, we saw these, these, these animals hanging in the trees. So here we have this, this structure that's come from something so small. And this parable that Jesus uses uh, in this instance to, to outline, well, this is the kingdom of God. Something so small that starts off can grow, it grows into this huge structure. Now, when we look back into, the, into parts of Scripture, we, we sort of, we see Jesus talking about um, the kingdom of God being something so small, or, or you, uh, you know, you can have faith as, as small as a child, or faith like a child. So this small amount can do such great things. But we can't get confused when Jesus talks to uh, Peter, is walked off after his uh, visions on the on the boat of walking on water and things like that. He speaks to the Pharisees, talking about ye of little faith. You can't get confused to go. Well, hang on a second. He's saying in this instance you've got little faith, and you, you're sort of wrong. But in this instance, the kingdom of God is so small. What, what's the what's what's going on here? When when Jesus refers to ye of little faith, it's a it's a inconsistent faith. You have faith that sort of comes and goes. You have faith that has that you have it in this instance, but you don't have it in this instance, sort of thing. So we've got to be uh, be assured that something so small, that faith so small, can grow into something so big. The kingdom of God, a little speck, a little seed planted in your heart, can grow and and be allowed to become something so big. In Ezekiel. Um, Chapter 17, verses 1 to 24, we see in the Old Testament that we go back, we always go back to, to find out what's happening going forward. But Ezekiel gives us a little parable himself in amongst. So Ezekiel 17, 1 to 24, the word of the Lord came to me, 
Son of man set forth an allegory and, and tell us, tell, tell it to the Israelites as a parable. Say to them, so Ezekiel had been told, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. A great eagle with powerful wings, long feathers, and a full plumage of varied colours came to Lebanon, taking hold of the top of the cedar. He broke off its topmost shoot and carried it away to a land of merchants, where he planted it in the city of traders. He took one of the seedlings of the land and put it in fertile soil. He planted it like a willow by abundant water, and it sprouted and became a low spreading vine. Its branches turned toward him, but its roots remained under it. So it became a vine, and it produced branches and put out leafy boughs. But there was another great eagle with powerful wings and full plumage. The vine now sent out its roots towards him from the plot where it was planted and stretched out its branches for, to him for water. It had been planted in good soil by abundant water so that it would produce branches, bear fruit, and become a splendid vine. So say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, will it thrive? Will it not be uprooted and stripped of its fruit so that it withers? All its new growth will wither. It will not take a strong army arm, or many people to pull it up by the roots. It's been planted, but will it thrive? Will it not wither completely when the east wind strikes it? Wither away in the plot where it grew. Ahead to verse 22. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I, will, I myself will take a shoot from the very top of the cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the, the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the tree, the dry tree, flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. How does this all tie in? In the first passage that the eagle is a reference to a king. It's, a, it's King Nebuchadnezzar in this instance, and the king takes on another king in that story. So a lot of Ezekiel is connected to Daniel and then connected to Revelation. So that, there's a lot, of, a lot of connection there that happens. The second eagle, the one that sort of is preferred to Pharaoh, and the passage works its way through, it's indicated by the writer from Ezekiel that this eagle is not to be trusted it is not the means by which things will be restored for good. And the roots from the vine will not be strong enough to withstand the forces that rise against it. So in these instances, the, the Israelites turned and were guided into specific areas that, that, that weren't the way forward. But it needed to happen because they learned a lot from it. And this is what God allow them to go through. The shoot from the very top of the cedar is Jesus. And Jesus, the kingdom of God, and in Jesus, the kingdom of God is revealed and the road to it for us is restored. And it produces branches. So this small twig at the top of this tree that represents uh, the Israelites people, that, that what's going on, God takes the, the topmost sprig. So we go, well, what am I supposed to what, what can happen with this? Plants it, the small, small sprig becomes a huge tree. So the kingdom of God is spreading like this. So that small seed that's been planted in you, is it spreading like that of a mustard seed? Sometimes you might not even know it. That small seeds can often be planted in others through the words that you give to them. So we only have to look at things like yesterday and, and hearing all of the all the things that are happening, like our Easter, Easter fair, the op shop stories, all those sort of things. Uh, we have kids coming last week and, and youth that are starting to regularly attend those, uh, those events. Those small seeds that are getting planted through the words that we can give to other people. 
the encouragement, the walking alongside people when they're having a bit of a tough time or sharing in the joys that people are expressing to us. Small things, you might not even know it, but these are all seeds that are being planted. And so, in leadership, we, we do need to look at the big picture. We do need to look at where um, our church is going and, and the people that are, that, are, that are rising up to do that. Who do we need in certain places? Going through a pastoral search at the moment. What, where is our church at? What is the profile of our church? And who is going to lead it into the future? And they're all the big things. But let's also focus on the small things. Um, we are, we're a world that is, uh, is, is guided by, well not guided, but is so heavily influenced by uh, social media and the so-called keyboard warriors. And so for me, in a position of leadership, I, I sort of go, well, for example, in the last little while, started to get a, a bit more heavily involved in certain aspects uh, of, of things within the footy club and things like that. So then you start, as you sort of start to sort of work your way through, you start hearing the things that are coming from behind. And you don't know where these things are coming from, but you're hearing things. Oh, I could be done better this way. I think you could be doing this. And so that's often the thing that people would get scared by in leadership. What if I, what if I don't do a very good job? What if I hear, what if I listen too much to the noise that's coming from behind? I don't know if I can handle that. And so for me, I sort of go, well, um, yeah, you can get a bit down on that, but I, I embrace it. And so I sort of go and try and find out where it's coming from and go, tell me, what do you think? Oh, okay. Let's embrace some of those ideas. So for us as, as, as a church, we're trying to get the message out there, and I've seen it, I've sort of seen it just recently in, in, in weeks, posts that I'm connected to, you sort of, um, churches that you sort of listen to, listen to and get different parts of uh, the word from, they post things on social media and suddenly comments start coming in from goodness knows where, talking about how bad this is, and oh, you know, um, this is not right, you can't be listening to this, and all this sort of thing that goes on. Hang on a second. You can get yourself really down by that. So we've got to be careful to embrace that. Sort of go, okay, what? So you, you're commenting uh, that, you know, this is all wrong, or that, uh, you know, how can you believe all this sort of stuff? Why are you commenting? Tell me your story about that. We've got to change the way that we kind of do things as leaders and embrace some of the commentary that's coming around. Learn from it. Not be frightened off by the things that are coming through. Because we live in a world that people have opinions. And now, people can have opinions without being seen. So, that's the changing nature of, of leadership. It's the changing nature because then you can sort of go, okay, I'm not gonna let this affect my big picture, but let's go small. What do you mean by the comment that you just made? And how do you think, how would you fix it? How, why, how would you approach this situation? You know, how would you do things differently? Give me, your, give me your ideas. Let's not be so fixed in the way that we do things. Let's embrace some of the differences that so the first hearing all of this is expectation. When we have expectations in life, it's anticipation. The excitement of what's to come and what we believe it's going to what we believe is going to come of it. When things are new, they're exciting and we put a lot of effort in. But as Jesus taught through his life here on earth, in what ways in what ways did Jesus meet all the expectations of the religious leaders? Well, he kind of didn't. He met the expectations of God. 
But the expectations of the religious leaders at the time was this majestic person that was going to save everything. They missed what was there in front of them. So expectations can often be false. You can turn your expectations, you can think that the expectations of others is what you should be expecting. But keep your expectations that of your anticipation and excitement. When we're approaching things, let's, when we look at those small things, we go, oh, that, that little small thing there. I'll give you an example. We, we have K4K, starts up again next week for those families that have our school holidays off. But we can look at that as the big, the sort of the big picture. But then we get hit by, uh, by COVID and things and all these things change and as leaders we go, oh, how do we, we need to get this, this same thing up and running and we go, hang on a second. There's a small aspect here that we could tweak. So what if we took Sunday morning and put it on Friday afternoon? What would happen then? And suddenly if the kids then want to invite their friends, we go, the, the parents of the friends go, Friday afternoon, not Sunday morning, it's different. Yeah, you can go. Because I don't have to take you. Oh, well, I have to take you. <laughs> Just that small aspect. And then we go, okay, the kids are here. And we can get alongside them with what they're doing. So that's the expectation, the anticipation, the excitement of something new. Surprise is the second thing. As our expectations begin to be fulfilled, uh, there's small surprises along the way. Uh, I've got a picture I'll share on Facebook. I've got approval from all the parents to, to share it on Facebook of last week, and uh, and it wasn't a surprise, but it was a it was it was that sense of excitement. But it was a little bit um, it was surprising that we could do both youths on the one night, and it was it was one of those things that goes okay. I was sort of thinking, oh, how's this going to work? But we had some great help from leaders. Uh, and, and these things began to be fulfilled. So that's the excitement but, and the surprise. But then as leaders, we go, there's a dip coming. What is the dip? I don't know. And as we begin to see our expectations realised and we're encouraged by all the surprise, the little things along the way, what happens when we have to do the dip? Where are we at? Where are we expected? So when I say that uh, that we 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 are encouraged by things we see on social media about great services and great worship, there's there's this encouragement that comes from it, and then you get this little comment that comes in the railroad. That can help cause you to dip slightly. So let's change our way of thinking and go. Let's not be discouraged by that, let's be encouraged that they're commenting. People wouldn't comment, people wouldn't get involved, people wouldn't have anything to say, they weren't, didn't feel strongly enough to have, have a say. So there's something there. So as leaders we've got to, we've got to try and, and think that way as well. And then it's the determination. Suddenly there's a determination to push ahead and achieve all of your expectations in and around that. It might be another, uh, another small surprise that you see coming from something small. You might realise something within yourself that makes you adjust and try something new as a means to achieve what you set out for. If you could see your gifts from God's perspective, what pursuit would you, what would you persevere in? So it's finding what your gifts are in all of this. So as the kingdom of God sort of grows like that mustard seed plant in your life, as its branches reach out and provide rest and comfort for the people in your life, what are your expectations? Where do you see the small surprises? Have you moved through a point where you're expecting a dip? Do you need to reset? spend time with God and seek clarity in that next part of your journey and to keep that determination to go.
the mustard seed, it's a, it, it's a parable that sort of gives us, parables were, were used to, to provide an understanding to those who, who doubted, who, who sort of weren't really sure about what was going on, to give them a, a sense of a picture of something, a picture of what was, what was going on. And so it was, a, it was a beautiful picture of the way that the kingdom of God can start so small and spread into something so big. I um, we've got a, a leadership podcast that uh, that Jeremy shared with me during the week, and it had a couple of quotes or a couple of key takeouts from uh, from the gentleman that that uh, was being interviewed on this on this podcast. And I wanted to carry you off is the uh, is the, the uh, person within the podcast, and he had a few takeouts of a podcast that was kind of um, why does leadership sort of scare people? Why is it, why is it so, um, so, uh, so off-putting at the moment? And so, some, of these, uh, some of these things. So I just wanted to share with you a, a couple of the quotes, a couple of the key takeouts from, um, from uh, I think it's Ed, Sel- Ed Stelter who, who did it. But he says, the la- in the last decade, hasn't just made evangelists into something else. It's revealed who evangel- evangelicals are and there's some real issues that need to be addressed in that. If 5% of your church isn't mad at you, you're probably not doing anything significant. But if 70% of your church is mad at you, you need to slow it down. So I hope you're not mad at me. <laughs> well, actually, I hope 5% of you are. <laughs> you're not going to make it in the next two or three years if you're going to be, if you're not going to be willing to have some people unhappy about the stands you are taking on the right things. 50 years from now, maybe two years from now, people are going to look back at the social media age as the lead pipes of the Romans, that it was simultaneously feeding and killing us at the same time. So all of these things, I I just wanted to paint that picture of this small thing just grow into a huge um, structure. So let's look at those small things. Have a, have a look at your week and what's gone on in it. Because if you start it sort of last Monday or last Sunday or Saturday or whatever, and you work your way through it, you'll actually find that you've done a lot. And even think to those people that you might have come into contact with along the way. What are they doing now? What are the co- some of the comments that they made to you? What are some of the things that you've read on social media? What are some of the things that you've encountered? What are some of the things that have made you frustrated in amongst that? And I'm like, wow. Flip it back. Find out that little small thing inside that, that week. There you go. Oh, maybe I can work with that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you're always revealing things to us. We thank you for the small things that become great things. And Father, we ask that you will help us to be more attentive to those things. As we walk through life and and consider ourselves responsible for what you've commissioned us to do, and that's to go and make disciples of each and every person we can get scared by that and we can often say to ourselves well I I'm not that I can't I can't do that but then when we reflect back we look at all those opportunities that you've already given us to be that light to be that, that voice <laughs> your word to others that we encounter in life and I just ask that we are attentive to those things and thank you in Jesus name. Amen.